Hi, welcome everyone. My name is John Davis and I edit MPA News published by Octo. On this webinar, we also have Ray Avrard, project manager for our Open Channels website. She's handling the webinar's technical side. And this webinar is co-hosted by the EBM Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. So happy you can all be here today. It's gonna to be a good presentation. We have Paul Whitaker of Kongsberg Satellite Services, or KSAT, which is 75% owned by the Norwegian government. KSAT operates a global network of satellite antennas, handling over 30,000 satellite passes per month from a diverse portfolio of sensors, including cloud penetrating synthetic aperture radar, high resolution optical satellites, and AIS. KSAT's global system of satellite antennas could be used for near real time surveillance of MPAs anywhere in the world. KSAT seeks to learn more about the needs of the MPA community, including identifying potential partners for pilot projects. The way this webinar will work is that Paul will present for about 30 minutes, then we'll have the rest of the time for questions. We definitely encourage questions or comments, and you can submit them at any point during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A button uh, on the webinar user interface menu at the bottom of your webinar screen. Just kind of hover your cursor there and it'll pop up. Also, if you have any technical difficulties, you can note those by clicking on the chat button and we'll do our best to help you. When we get to the question and answer portion, I will moderate the questions, taking one at a time and asking the question to Paul. So let's get started. Paul, I will turn it over to you now. Great, thanks a lot, John. Uh, and thanks to all of you uh, following along on your, on your computers. Uh, my name is Paul Whitaker. I work for, uh, as John mentioned, a company called Kongsberg Satellite Services. Um, most people in the satellite industry know us as KSAT. Um, many people may have come across Kongsberg before. Kongsberg's a, a big uh, multi-dimensional Norwegian company with uh, lots and lots of employees doing lots of different things in the maritime space. Um, but KSAT's pretty unique. We're really um, a subset of this company. We're only about 160 people at the moment. Uh, we are growing, but we're still pretty small and pretty independent from the bigger Kongsberg group. And really all we do is uh, stuff that's focused on, on satellites and satellite-derived information. This is a picture of our global headquarters uh, on the small island of Tromso, uh, northern Norway, 69 degrees north, um, 1,000 kilometers north of where I now sit in the city of Oslo. Um, and this is where basically the majority of our employees are, are coming to work every day. You can see there are some satellite antennas in our backyard there at these facilities, and um, it's quite a, a nice place to work. Um, although our key asset is actually another thousand kilometers north, and that's on the island of Svalbard, uh, where we own and operate the world's uh, largest and northernmost uh, ground station for satellite antennas. This is really a, a pretty fascinating facility. Um, as, I, as, I, as I came to know it and came to understand the satellite world when I joined KSAT about eight or nine years ago, um, you know, the first thing somebody told me was, well, there's more polar bears than there are people on the island of Svalbard, and it's uh, dark most of the year, and when it's not dark, it's bright sun 24 hours a day, and it's uh, snowy, and there's avalanches, and we have to lay fiber optic cables a thousand kilometers under the ocean to connect it to the mainland. Um, and it just begs the question, okay, that's all cool, but why? Why would you put antennas so far north? Uh, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking through this picture you're seeing now on the left uh, to explain exactly why it's so important that our uh, Svalbard station is where it is and, and that the infrastructure is located where it is. The purple circle that you're seeing there is what we can, uh, what we can see from any one of our antennas uh, on Svalbard. So this is quite a large circle. And anything that passes through this circle in terms of a polar orbiting satellite uh, uh, provides us the opportunity to either receive information that has been gathered by the satellite or to send up tasking information to the satellite on that pass. The very thin orange lines that you'll notice are 24 hours of one satellite. So this happens to be a satellite called ReSat, which is an Indian SAR satellite. And over the 24 hours in this example, it will have made 14 passes around the Earth, each one coming up and around the poles, not quite over the North Pole. You'll see there's a circle there in the middle where they don't quite come, but each pass coming up and around. And the really important takeaway from this slide is that each one of those orange lines comes through the purple circle, 
which means every time the satellites go around the Earth, we're able to communicate with them. So if we're monitoring or receiving information from a satellite that's just uh, made acquisitions in Australia or South America or Africa, no matter where it is, it's always coming up into immediate contact with our antennas and, and ready for communication uh, with our antenna network. You can see if you, if you shifted our antenna, the center of that purple circle where it says Norway Svalbard, if you shifted that even just a little bit south, you're gonna start to have circumstances where those orange lines do not pass through the purple circle, which means we wouldn't be able to communicate with them on that pass and we'd have to wait until they went around again. So one of our core capabilities is, is delivering near real time information pulled down off of these satellites and getting satellite derived information into the hands of users as quickly as possible. And the only reason we're able to do that is because of the location of this ground station. So it's been there a long time. It's been there about 20 years. Uh, we've got well over 50 antennas systems up there now, ranging from very small ones to very large ones. Uh, and we're up there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, receiving information. Um, this, this unique station, however, is not our only uh, polar ground station. We also have one uh, at the other pole in Antarctica, which is known as Troll Station, hosted on a facility run by the Norwegian Polar Institute. And you can see on the right picture there up on top of that hill where our antennas are located. Uh, this one doesn't have quite as much uh, visibility into every single pass. In this case, we see 12 of the 14 daily passes from a, a typical satellite. So about 26 times a day, uh, when you combine between Svalbard and Antarctica, we're able to communicate with a polar orbiting satellite. So these satellites uh, take about 100 minutes to go around the Earth, and, and we're never more than around 40 minutes out of contact with the satellites, which is a really unique capability and uh, um, allows us to support people who own satellites and provide information and services derived from, uh, from these satellites. Uh, these polar stations really underpin most of the current services that we deliver. Um, but in recent years, we have also uh, built out more of a global network. Um, you can see here where Antarctica and, and Svalbard are both located on this map. But in addition, we have highlighted other antennas that we own distributed around the world. Uh, these are smaller antennas, and these are designed really to support um, the new generation of satellites. So the satellite industry is a really interesting one at this time. There's a lot of changes going on. Uh, it used to be that satellites were massive things that took years and years to plan and, and were very precise, highly uh, meticulously designed and, and built uh, uh, pieces, assets. Uh, but in recent years, uh, as in many other industries, um, the use of off-the-shelf technologies and, and uh, the ability to make things smaller and therefore cheaper has really taken hold. So there's a whole new generation of satellites which are smaller and cheaper and, and far more abundant. And, and so therefore we've built out this network of smaller antennas which are capable of uh, working with these, these smaller satellites as it turns out. Um, and just to give you a sense of, of, of what this looks like in practice, um, there's a great satellite that, that many of you may be aware of that's still in orbit called Landsat 8, which is a, a NASA satellite that we support. And here to scale, I'm showing you uh, the next generation from uh, a company called Planet Labs. This is one of their so-called Dove optical satellites. These are both optical satellites, but you can see how the one on the right is significantly smaller, lighter, um, has a much shorter uh, expected lifespan uh, and is much cheaper and easier to launch. So there are uh, many, many more of these uh, new generation small, small satellites in orbit. Um, in terms of who uses our network, um, basically uh, most satellite companies that, are, that have uh, satellites that are placed in, in polar orbits uh, are using the KSAT network. Everybody from, from NASA, who has you know, over 10,000 employees, down to, say, uh, there's a company on here called ISI, which is a, a small Finnish company. We've just recently launched a, a, a very small SAR satellite uh, and probably has, I would guess, uh, 25, 30 employees at this point. So a full range from, from very small to very large companies um, the majority of the um, industry who is using polar orbiting satellites. Um, just to take a quick, uh, quick 
detour to distinguish what I mean when I say polar orbiting. Um, this, this is different than what's called a geostationary satellite, which is much, much farther away from the Earth, spinning with the Earth, always looking at the same point on Earth. And a geostationary satellite is going to be the type that you use for things like communications, weather forecasting, GPS, the kind of things where you need to be looking at the same place, in, place on the Earth all the time. To do any useful Earth observations, so to take an optical picture to send and receive a synthetic aperture radar signal, or to receive an AIS signal, for instance, you need to be much, much closer to, into the Earth in something called a polar orbit, where you're coming up and around, as I described in the previous slides. Just to put some numbers against uh, everybody using our network, uh, last year there were 249 commercial non-geostationary spacecraft launched in the U.S. 243 of those spacecraft are using our network, so something like 98% of the industry uh, is using the KSAT network. Uh, and as, as I believe John mentioned in the beginning, we're now handling over 30,000 satellite passes uh, every, single, every single month. Um, so that's a lot of satellite talk. Uh, you guys are here to talk about MPAs and um, just to give you a sense of what sensors we use and what satellites we use that are of relevance to you. And um, without knowing my audience here very well, uh, I apologize if some of this is obvious or redundant or in fact, if I'm moving too fast, but I'm just gonna quickly walk through the three types of satellite that we primarily use for this audience. And the first being satellite AIS, the um, information system which was uh, originally invented as a, as a safety feature, originally a coastal phenomenon, which in recent years has been uh, capable of uh, being used at the high seas from satellite sensors. In this case, I'm showing some interesting examples of behaviors that might be interesting to people concerned with, with IUU fishing in terms of either uh, potential transshipment or maybe sitting outside of somebody's exclusive economic zone, um, moving in and out, this type of behavior. And AIS is a, is a wonderful tool. It's a very rich data stream. There's a lot of analytics that can be done. It gives you all sorts of information about who a vessel is and what they're doing and where they're going. Uh, but the limitation, of course, as you'll see in this picture on the right, is that it's a voluntary compliance system that can be very easily switched off. So uh, people who are looking to, to potentially monitor, say, an MPA for people who are not meant to be somewhere, um, people who are using AIS are likely, and we have seen this quite a lot, to simply be shutting it off and, and hiding from view. So while this is really useful information and we use it in combination with a number of other sensors, it's difficult to rely exclusively on satellite AIS because people who don't want to be seen can just turn it off. Another interesting type of sensor that we use in, that comes from a polar orbiting satellite is optical imagery. So this is really... Uh, a lot like a photograph, like the kind of thing that you'll see on, on Google Earth, or indeed, I believe, on Google Maps. Now you can see a lot of satellite imagery. Uh, and this is really useful in the, in the um, vessel detection, vessel monitoring world, because you can see a lot more information than you might on a synthetic aperture radar scene. Um, there are various resolutions, but you can, um, you can fairly reliably make, make decisions about what type of boat you're looking at, um, is this a, a tugboat? Is this a tanker boat? Is this a fishing boat? Um, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's really helpful and, and easy to interpret and people who are um, not familiar with, with the black and white speckle of a SAR image may be comfortable working with optical imagery. But again, there's a big limitation as I showed you with AIS. And in this case, the problem is clouds. So as you can see, here's a monitoring effort. We were, we were trying to monitor. This is the border between Gabon and, and, and the Congo. Uh, and in fact, on this day, it was nothing but clouds and there was nothing we could see. So again, um, very useful sensor, but a very serious limitation as well. This is just an example. It's a beautiful image. So I'm just showing this mostly because I, uh, I like to look at it. It's an it's a image from the European Space Agency from a satellite called Sentinel-2, which is wonderful free imagery. This is one of the first scenes taken. Uh, some of you may, able to, may be able to see a vessel cutting through this, this algae uh, from sort of the top right, if you will, towards the center. Um, anyways, just to give you an example of the kind of beautiful imagery you can see in an optical scene. Before I move on to its, its ugly cousin, Synthetic Aperture Radar, SAR, which is really the workhorse for us because SAR can see through clouds and SAR can work at night. And SAR can very reliably, uh, regardless of atmospheric conditions, detect uh, when there are vessels on the water. 
Now, uh, the picture here on the right is also the limitation, which is that all you're really getting at the end of the day from, our, from a SAR scene is an indication that there is a white dot present. Um, depending on the resolution, you may or may not be able to tell that this is a boat as opposed to an iceberg. You may or may not be able to get a reliable estimate of the length of that vessel. But you're not gonna be limited by clouds and you can very reliably uh, see over extremely large areas and get a sense of is there vessel traffic in an area or not. And indeed, you can correlate this with other indications from optical or from AIS to get a fuller picture. So what I'm showing here in terms of SAR are the various satellite missions that KSAT supports, that we own the processing equipment to actually uh, handle in-house from start to finish on um, ordering and downloading and processing the imagery and delivering the reports, which allows us to provide information in near real time without going back to the satellite owners themselves. So KSAT has invested in RadarSat2, Cosmos SkyMed, Sentinel, TerraSRX, Resat1, which is no longer operational, and a satellite called PAS, which will be uh, very interesting, which has been launched but is not yet operational. It will be the first satellite that has both SAR and AIS on the same sensor. So it will be um, consistent timestamps on those things and no need for correlation. Some of this may uh, be uh, obvious and interesting to some of you and some of it may not make a lot of sense. I'm trying to move fairly quickly through this. So anyone who's uh, confused, please feel free to, to follow up with me afterwards if anything I'm saying either doesn't make sense or needs further elaboration. This is a really unique thing that we're able to work across all of these, um, these different SAR missions. This is um, from many different nations, many different original motivations. So RadarSat2 is a Canadian satellite that was launched over 10 years ago to monitor ICE. Cosmos SkyMed is four Italian X-band SAR satellites that were used for defense purposes, the Italian military. Sentinel is a European research uh, satellite. TerraSRX is a German-French uh, constellation of two satellites originally designed to uh, take very high uh, digital elevation models of the Earth. And Resat-1 was originally used to monitor rice crops during the Indian monsoon. The point being that at KSAT, we use all of these different satellites to use for very different purposes and integrate them together to do things like vessel detection or oil spill detection and so on. I'm gonna come back for a second to this slide. It's a little bit like the first slide that I showed uh, where you're seeing how things come together at the poles. In this case, I'm not showing a thin narrow line. I'm showing a actual Scansar wide scene. So in this case, the frames are 500 kilometers by 500 kilometers and are more like what an actual scene looks like. But the interesting thing here is I wanna actually turn the globe a little bit and look at the slide on the right to make the point for why we need all those different SAR satellites. As you'll see here, this is again, 24 hours of a single satellite. And when you look at it from the side view, you can see that there's huge gaps in what a, what a satellite might cover. So this, this example is RadarSat2. And in this case, if you were looking to monitor, say, the southeast coast of um, Africa, or perhaps the Indian Ocean there, uh, this satellite simply isn't going overhead. So if you're only using a single satellite, you wouldn't be able to use this source on this day. You might have to wait another two days, three days before your satellite goes over. For our purposes, that's, that's not acceptable. We, don't, uh, we try to monitor things much more frequently than that. And so by using all of these different satellites in combination, we're able to cover the whole Earth once or twice a day, no matter where you are, even at the mid-latitudes. So no matter where your MPA may be, our combination of SAR satellites in particular will allow us to monitor it with, with a great frequency. And what do we actually do with this? So what does a, what does a vessel detection uh, report look like from KSAT? Here's an example of a scene from uh, a couple months ago, I guess it is now. Uh, this is the Ivory Coast in Africa, where we've taken a SAR scene. This, is, this, is, this example is Sentinel. And all of these dots here represent vessels of varying sizes. This is the first page of one of our reports that we would have delivered in near real time, uh, where we're, we're identifying um, boats that are visible in the SAR, boats that are visible in the AIS, and we're correlating those together. So in a situation where we had access to VMS, or if we were just using AIS, we might say if the regulatory regime is such that everybody is meant to be broadcasting on VMS or on AIS, we're able to say, what about these boats here? They're big enough that we're seeing them in SAR. They don't appear to be broadcasting on VMS or AIS. Maybe they're trying to hide. Maybe they're doing suspicious things. Maybe we should go check them out. In the case of monitoring a remote MPA, this might just give you a sense of 
how many vessels are there that we're not seeing if we're using exclusively IIS to have a sense of the traffic in our area. Uh, we have much more information in our reports, details about uh, what we're seeing on AIS, uh, length estimates, headings, all sorts of things that we're uh, deriving from the SAR. But just to give you a sense of what one of our reports looked like in the interest of time, uh, this is a this is a, a recent, fairly recent uh, screenshot of one of our reports to give you a sense of what actual the core information we're delivering is. So this comes as both a, a PDF file, this can come as a KML file that could be dropped into Google Earth. Indeed, it could be uh, provided a number of different ways that could that could be dropped into whatever sort of native GIS system uh, somebody might be using. I'm gonna walk now through a couple of cases of people who are using our services and, and how they're using it, just to give you a flavor for, uh, to stimulate any ideas about, about how this might appeal to you. So one of our biggest clients is EMSA, the European Maritime uh, Safety Authority, uh, for whom we provide both oil, oil spill detection and vessel detection reports. So in 2017, we delivered um, 2,725 reports to them, about 227 a month. And so far this year, we've already delivered more than that. So the volume is, is increasing. Um, the point here being how quickly we're able to get information uh, to, to the end user, in this case, EMSA. They're very strict on delivery times. So uh, we actually pay a, a fairly stiff penalty when our information comes more than 20 minutes after, uh, after we receive uh, the satellite information. Uh, 20 minutes for an initial notification that there's an oil spill or there's an alert vessel that we need to monitor, and 30 minutes for the complete analysis. So really, really tight deadlines, really up against it on time. Um, and we're pretty good in terms of our proficiency. Uh, for the first months of 2018, we had 87.5%, meaning that we, were, we delivered 87% of the reports in less than 20 minutes, um, and our best month was, was 90%. So about 90% of the time in European waters, we're delivering reports in 20 to 30 minutes. Um, but this is true, as I said, we can monitor anywhere in the world. We're quite active in Australia, and just to give you a sense there, the, the average time from when the satellite goes over and sends down a SARG signal and receives a return, completes its orbit up to either uh, Svalbard or Antarctica, is downloaded and processed into an image that a human being can review and create a report based on the information that they're seeing and get it out to the end user is still less than 60 minutes. And Australia is about as far away from, from Norway as, as you can possibly get. So I think it's reasonable to expect um, deliveries pretty much anywhere in the world on the order of an hour or, or less, which is a pretty unique capability from KSAT. As a second example, just in terms of near real-time capabilities, um, I mentioned a little bit some of the work that we had done in Gabon, or I had shown an example of a, of a cloudy optical image from Gabon. Uh, last year, I did some work there. Gabon's a really interesting place. Um, they've created, I believe, something like 25% of their exclusive economic zone is now marine protected areas, but they don't have a, a single vessel to patrol. So they've got you know paper parks uh, uh, with, with no real understanding of what's going on in these areas. Um, an NGO you may have heard of called the Sea Shepherd assisted them last year and provided a vessel. Uh, the Gabonese Navy and the Gabonese Fisheries the departments were on board telling them who and where to board and doing the boarding and, and doing the analysis of uh, who was where. And we provided them with information from both SAR and optical and AIS imagery uh, to help them uh, patrol efficiently and, and indeed this led to some uh, rests of some uh, Chinese trawlers coming across from the Congo and uh, our support was really helpful in their limited time. So they had a little bit of time where they had a vessel available to patrol and they really wanted to send a signal that they were out there watching after doing all the administrative work of creating these MPAs. Uh, doesn't really do much good if there's no patrolling going on at all. So we were able to support them in that effort. And then the final case that I thought might be interesting to this audience goes back a few years to when um, we did some uh, problem assessment around Easter Island with, with Pew. So Pew had recognized a problem whereby the, um, the indigenous people in Easter Island were not catching as much fish as they uh, had historically been used to catching. They saw bright lights on the horizon at night. They didn't really have a sense of what was going on. And so over the course of a year, we delivered about 270 SAR-based reports to them to try and gauge if there was a lot of activity. Um, there wasn't a tremendous amount of activity then. There was some. At that point in time, there was a change in government in Chile and it sort of lost momentum back in 2013. Uh, but I was happy to see that, that last year, 
they created a large uh, marine protected area around Easter Island. Uh, and while I wouldn't take credit for this, uh, it was interesting to see that um, some of the work we had initially done uh, eventually lent support to uh, what was the creation of an MPA. I believe they're now using primarily aircraft to monitor this MPA um, because they still don't have a good port for a, um, a vessel to, to, to capable of spending a lot of time at sea, but they do have quite a long runway, which was originally designed for, this, for the space shuttle, as I understand it. In any case, that's sort of three different examples very quickly to show that we can deliver either um, active patrol support in near real time, so really, really fresh information from a variety of sources, or very long-term sort of problem assessment, which might be relevant for more remote MPAs where people just want to keep an eye on, uh, is there a lot of activity there or not, sort of a, a binary question or quantifying the scale of, of how many vessels are active in a particular area. And just to make the point here that we see more than just boats, this is going back again to last summer in Gabon where we uh, saw some, some fairly significant oil spills while we were looking for vessels. Oil spill detection using SAR is, is really uh, the core service offering that KSAT pioneered over 20 years ago. We were the first company in the world to deliver an operational oil spill detection service. We're now actively monitoring um, every asset in Norway, every, every offshore platform and, and oil asset in Norway is monitored on a daily basis. And we're working for most of the um, major oil companies and we're active in, in, in many places in the world, including the Gulf of Mexico, South America, Australia, et cetera, where we're, we're monitoring for oil spills. So in addition to, I don't know how much crossover appeal there is to seeing oil in addition to, to vessels here, but just to let you know that SAR is also an excellent tool for, um, for seeing oil on the surface of the ocean in addition to any vessels that may be present. Last week I was in Peru, just to give you an example of another example of what our imagery looks like. This was from uh, while I was in Lima, I provided these reports. You can see there's some clusters of, I believe these are um, vessels targeting anchovies um, in some areas that are either open or closed and different ways that you might keep an eye on it. So the big picture here on the left is a, uh, a version of our KML file. Uh, and on the right again is the first page of our vessel detection report, which is correlating SAR and AIS to, to indicate which vessels may be of interest. And again, we're providing indications of length and, and some other information and support. So it's not just dots uh, on the screen, but, but primarily what you're seeing in SAR is, um, is every vessel, whether or not they wanna be seen, whereas in AIS, you're really only seeing those who are uh, voluntarily willing to be seen. So KSAT supports uh, a lot, as I've shown, of different uh, commercial and government launch vehicles. Um, shown here is, a, is quite an exciting one. Um, not allowed to talk much about it, but, but maybe some of you recognize it and have been aware of it. It's something that's received a lot of attention. But to me, the most exciting of all, uh, and one of the main reasons that I'm spending so much time in the IE fishing space and the MPA space these days, uh, is a new constellation that's gonna be launched uh, starting next year by the Norwegian government. Uh, which will be called Microsar, and I think it's going to be really, really important. So I'm just going to uh, conclude here by walking you through uh, this new Norwegian constellation called Microsar. Um, it's intended to be a constellation of roughly 10 small SAR satellites, which are going to be specifically optimized for ship detection. So um, when I originally was showing my, my SAR slide and showing you all the different missions that we integrate, uh, that's that's impressive to those of us in the industry, but it doesn't add up to 10. So 10 satellites is, is a phenomenal number and will be really great. We're talking about less than three average, less than three hours of average revisit time. So coming over most points in the earth um, more frequently than every three hours. So really robust coverage is gonna be possible. These are gonna be simultaneous AIS and SAR sensors. So uh, again, as with PAS, this will have both AIS and SAR together, so no, no possibility of error in the correlation steps if the satellites, as they do at the moment, go over at separate times. And we'll be able to use our local ground station network, so that extended network that I showed of, of antennas all around the world will be capable of both receiving and importantly tasking these satellites. So very short notice tasking. Today the industry standard is three days. So if you want a satellite image and you're gonna request it of a SAR satellite owner, um, or you're gonna work with KSAT to get that, the typical answer is gonna be, okay, I can get you something in 
uh, three days. Um, this is going to be more like uh, less than 60 minutes when we can task a satellite from, from our network. So a real step change in terms of how quickly we're able to task the satellites, tell it what we want it to take images of. SAR satellites are very power heavy instruments. They don't typically take imagery unless they're specifically told to do so. And so the tasking step, asking it what to take an image of is a very important one. And it, at the moment, a very time consuming one. And we're looking to solve that bottleneck by using this global network. It's also gonna be quite high resolution. So uh, roughly four meter resolution, which is um, much better than most of the uh, standard SAR uh, options that I typically would use for vessel detection. Um, as some of you may appreciate, there's a trade-off between the footprint of an of a image and the resolution. Uh, in this case, we're still gonna have roughly 200 kilometer swap width. So a pretty good balance of, of scene size and area of ground that we're covering uh, with the resolution of the of the image itself and at four meter resolution you're able to do some actual classification of vessels so when I had shown the optical slide and I was talking about what makes it really interesting and the ability to classify vessels by what type of vessel it is that's the kind of thing you can only do with SAR when you're at this very high resolution and, and I think we'll be able to do that once these are once these are in orbit so it's going to be um, really high revisit really nice resolution, a mix of AIS and SAR, and most importantly of all, this is gonna be owned by the Norwegian government, which means it's gonna be far more affordable than the typical commercial SAR satellite. The Norwegian government really wants to be seen as a leader in the fight against IEU fishing. Those of you in this world may recognize that um, they support a lot of different initiatives globally and, and are putting a lot of money uh, into this fight, and, and this is yet another uh, I believe contribution that we'll be making uh, in Norway to to this fight by by trying to get SAR imagery more widely utilized by making it both um, better in terms of the the quality of the vessel detection that we're able to deliver and far cheaper so available to uh, a larger a larger audience. So if you're somebody who um, knows enough about SAR and AIS to say this all makes sense but it's too darn expensive. Um, it may be that I'm able to change your mind on that as these satellites get launched because I think we're going to be uh, working with quite a different price model and that's something that I'm interested to hear some some feedback from you guys on, on on how valuable this is and how appealing this is and if this is something that um, you would be willing to um, uh, talk about uh, if there was a, a price model that would work or if there was a price point that would work. Um, and so uh, I think this is really exciting. Now when a lot of companies launch new satellites and they're seeking capital and support, uh, they make very aggressive marketing pitches. Most companies that were about to support uh, a new 10 SAR satellite constellation would be far more aggressive in, in, marketing, uh, in marketing this. We're not really in that position at KSAT. This is going to be owned by the Norwegian government. This is not something that we need to be um, particularly aggressive about. So we're not very, you can see here, this is a fairly simple cartoonish picture of what these are gonna look like. These are just bullet points that I've written myself. This is not a slick marketing pitch. And one of the reasons for that is that we've seen a lot of these things go wrong. Uh, a lot of things can fail. A lot of things can uh, look good on paper, but not come to pass. And so while I'm optimistic about this, I think our current capabilities for what's on orbit now are compelling enough that those of you here could engage with me on, a, on an interesting and useful conversation. Uh, even if this if this fails spectacularly. So I'm excited about Microsar, but it's certainly not something that we are um, pushing aggressively because we're going to sort of take a more relaxed approach and make sure that it works before we try and actually um, uh, bring it to the world. So uh, this is something that um, is exciting and ambitious and, um, and fairly risky. So um, we're being a bit cautious about it. So just a quick aside again here, just to make the point on the high resolution, you can, I'm just gonna walk you through three different resolutions. Here on the far left, this is a typical Scansar image. So like the ones that I had shown before, you know, hundreds of kilometers on a side. And you can do simple vessel detection, but again, ships could be a single pixel or a small dot. You don't really know much about them other than that there's probably a boat there. It could be an iceberg, it could be something else, that could be any floating object that looks like a boat and therefore is a false positive. Um, when you move up a little higher to the to the smaller footprint of a strip map, 
you start to get some more reliable differentiation between small boats and large boats. Um, but again, some still some false positives or some erroneous lengths. It's very difficult depending on the, the way that a boat is pitching in the water to, to reliably say exactly how long it is. But when you get up to the type of resolutions that we're gonna be talking about with Microsar, you then get to the ability to, to sort of dis discriminate features and, and to um, have more reliable detections, fewer false positives, and you're able to classify the boat type even using SAR. So I thought it was worth just uh, pointing out a little bit why we care so much about uh, the resolution on that and why all of these are useful for different things depending on um, exactly how concerned you are about uh, false positives or classifying your boats or if you're indeed just trying to cover a very large area and get a sense of what boats are out there then maybe you want to be looking at something like Scansar or, or somewhere in between. So each case is fairly different. At case that we have an order desk of four people who does nothing else other than um, uh, trying to procure the optimal imagery for the specific use case. So depending on people's budgets and their needs and the timeliness that they need uh, we'll work to find what's the right satellite in an unbiased way and then we'll go ahead and use that because um, we don't particularly mind which, which satellite it is and we work with, with all of them. So in the meantime, just this is basically my last slide. I have some questions for you guys. Um, I don't really know what the MPA community needs. I don't know what of this is appealing or uh, what of this is not. Um, is SAR and optical imagery helpful to you? Does this excite people or is this something that is familiar that you're already using. If you're not using it, are these barriers technical barriers whereby you're not sure if this is really gonna help or are they financial where you don't think you can afford it? Is near real-time deliveries important in this sector? Are you, are you monitoring areas that were so far away that there's no possibility for active enforcement or follow-up anyhow? And our ability to deliver information in near real-time really isn't that important, which is okay. It's just something I'd like to know. Um, and if you're monitoring, how often is sufficient? Is it, is it okay to be looking at a remote MPA once a day, twice a day, once a week, once a month. I don't really know, uh, just throwing that out there. And, I, and I'm curious how much reliance and concern there is in this audience with, with the use of AIS. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies now that are, that are doing really interesting things with, with AIS analytics and, um, and there's a lot of free data that's, that's time delayed but it is exclusively AIS derived. And I worry a little bit because when I do the type of analysis that we do, I realize that that so few vessels are using AIS that if we're drawing broad conclusions about um, how much transshipment is occurring or where vessels are active and we're only using AIS, um, it's variable, but um, even in the best of situations, we're not looking at the full picture. And in some cases, we're looking at a very small fraction of the actual vessels that are out on the water, either because um, they're not regulated in that way or, or people are explicitly trying to hide. So. As, we, uh, as I conclude here, and I turn it back over to John to, to help me out with the question and answer period, I just thought I'd tee up some questions that I'm particularly interested in hearing from you guys uh, as, as, as we go forward. So that's all I have today. I hope that was, is, that was interesting for you. Uh, I'm gonna leave it there now and, uh, and, and take some questions. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, again, I'm John Davis, editor of MPA News. We now open up the webinar to audience Q&A for the next uh, 20 or so minutes. If audience members have a question for Paul, uh, you can submit it by clicking on the Q&A button on the webinar user interface menu at the bottom of your webinar screen. Just hover your, your cursor over it and we will be drawing from those questions throughout this Q&A session. Uh, first question is from Anya, uh, who says, very interesting talk, thank you. A couple of questions. One, does each report include process data, for example, integrated SAR and AIS info, or raw data? And two, where might one be able to get an idea of ballpark costs for a particular MPA and monitoring frequency? Great. So. There's sort of two flavors. Um, you know, we can deliver the extracted information in the type of reports that I've been showing you here. So I guess that's uh, what you were calling processed information. So where we have taken a, a SAR image that is licensed to KSAT um, and we have done the interpretation of where the vessels are and we have used AIS information that's licensed to KSAT and done the correlation and provided it to you. That's um, cheaper and less constrained by um, what is a fairly um, um, difficult 
end user license world in the satellite world. But we also do have customers who actually want the raw data. They want to actually own the SAR image and do their own analytics around it, or they have a reason to believe that um, owning the, the full pixel data and running their own algorithms or their own investigation is, is important to them. And we do both things. So there are some clients that we deliver just raw SAR information for them to, or not, not raw, I guess isn't, isn't technically right, but um, high resolution, full, full pixel, signed, licensed SAR imagery for their own use. And in some cases, we're just providing a case add value added product uh, that they can use um, without any sort of license constraints at all. You can share it with whoever you want. You can do whatever you want with that information. You own that information as opposed to the satellite, the actual full resolution imagery whereby you're going to be uh, under some fairly strict constraints and you're going to be paying quite a lot more. Uh, one interesting thing in the SAR world is that all imagery that's taken eventually winds up in a commercially available archive. So if you ever got a SAR image and you weren't, you weren't typically, if you were typically just buying the extracted information and there was ever a situation where there was something so interesting that you actually in that case wanted to own that imagery, it's not like it's lost. You can always go back and, and buy an individual report or an individual SAR scene uh, if there was say a big oil spill or something that was gonna uh, need to be shown in court or something like that. In terms of a, a sense of cost, you know, it's really highly variable depending on our sensor mix and the timeliness and the resolution and indeed um, what you're interested in doing. So KSET has traditionally um, built a business around oil spill detection. We're fairly newcomers to the uh, vessel identification illegal fishing world. Um, part of that is because we're excited about microSAR. Part of that is because there's an increasing focus globally on, on this problem as it grows and there's more um, NGOs and governments paying attention and putting some money into the space. And so therefore, we're interested in learning a lot really quickly in advance of the, of the Microsar launch. So I wanna get involved in projects and I've got, uh, I wanna learn from them and I wanna learn from you and I've got the backing of my management to do so. So I think on a project by project basis, the prices at this point are a bit variable and I would encourage anybody who has a specific idea uh, about how they'd like to use this information just to contact me directly and we can talk individually about um, different pricing models that we might be able to offer you. I know that's a fairly wishy-washy answer, but the, the, the prices really are so highly variable that I'm reluctant to even throw out uh, um, a rule of thumb sort of uh, example because um, they, can, they can move around significantly depending on if you're talking about I don't need it in near real time. I don't need it every day. I just need one sensor once a month or I want twice a day monitoring. These things are really different. And, and so uh, it's, it's kind of reckless for me to, to talk without, without engaging you individually to talk about pricing. But I, mean, I encourage you just to reach out to me and we can have that conversation one on one. All right, thanks Paul. Are you anticipating that when MPAs um, partner with you or, or serve as pilot sites, um, uh, with KSAT that at least some of the costs may be picked up by NGOs that in turn are partnering with those MPAs or concerned about those MPAs um, or foundations? Yeah, John, I think, we're, I think we're in a place now where at least on a, on, a, on a pilot or a project basis, we've got a lot of flexibility. Um, so I do anticipate um, there are opportunities for finding third parties or indeed for KSAT to, to supplement some of the costs that might typically be borne. So if you go out and you look at a commercial price list from a satellite owner, um, these are going to be significantly higher than I think what we, we, we will tend to be uh, talking about. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, we have a question from Mauricio uh, with regard to Global Fishing Watch, which I think has, has in general, perhaps a higher profile, at least within the MPA community, um, in, terms of, in terms of satellite um, observation of MPAs. What, what relationship does KSAT have with Global Fishing Watch, if any? Do you feed information to them? Uh, have you partnered with them at all over the years? Yeah, so I would, I would classify us as having a, a pretty close relationship. We know um, the senior people at Global Fishing Watch quite well and are working on um, a variety of initiatives. They were involved in the work I was doing last week in Peru and we're working on some other concepts going forward. So KSET and Global Fishing Watch, I would say, are partners. Um, although we haven't done a whole lot of actual work together um, at the moment, we are, we are framing things and I think we will continue to work together. Um, at the moment, as I understand it, um, they are 
with the exception of Indonesia, where they've published some uh, VMS information, um, and with the exception of the VIRS visible infrared light information that can be used to monitor squid fishing, um, I think they're primarily using AIS as a, as a sensor source. So all of the commercial AIS um, providers, meaning Exact Earth, Orbcom, Inspire, use the KSAT network for um, receiving their information, uh, which are what underpin what Global Fishing Watch does. Now, we don't provide that directly to Global Fishing Watch, but they're using AIS information that originally flowed through our network. Um, not sure if that helps make it more clear or less clear, uh, but we, you know, we, as I said before, we think AIS is a wonderful tool, but we're a little bit skeptical of it as an exclusive tool because um, I think you miss so much of the picture. So Global Fishing Watch is doing great work with, with AIS information, and we're starting to do some projects with them where they're gonna look and maybe bring some SAR into the mix to look beyond just AIS at so-called dark targets that are not broadcasting on AIS or VMS. So, you know, for instance, in Indonesia, um, where they've made their, the VMS information public, um, that's all good. It reveals a lot more information than, than just AIS and, and um, is, is a really helpful data stream. But if you actually talk to the Indonesians when they do a, when they do a SAR survey, they'll tell you that about seven to 10% of their boats are showing up on AIS VMS. So even on a VMS system, you're missing, you know, something like 90% of the vessels that are out in the water that you can see using SAR. That's amazing. Um, a similar question about uh, satellite catapult slash ocean mine, which um, also had the name Project Eyes on the Seas uh, for a while. Uh, what relationship does KSAT have with Ocean Mind at this point? We don't have any direct relationship with Ocean Mind, and I, and I don't know enough really to speak about what their business model is. I know they're doing similar things in terms of um, they are procuring SAR and correlating it with AIS. I don't believe they are doing it in a multi-mission way. So the, and again, this is, I, I really am not particularly comfortable speaking about their business because it's not something that I know a whole lot about. Um, I feel like in this space, we're all, we're all trying to solve a problem together. And so I'm reluctant to ever speak in a way that, that makes me sound like I'm, I'm taking a competitive position. But as I understand it, they primarily source from radar set too. So they're using basically one, one SAR option and they're not using it in near real time. So a little bit different than how we differentiate ourselves in terms of pulling from a variety of SAR satellites and, and, and really timely deliveries. And I think they're basically doing the same core analytics that we've been doing for 20 years, which is, you know, which is taking SAR and, and trying to do vessel identification. Um, and then uh, in recent years, when, when when satellite AIS has been available, doing the correlation there to, to, to highlight the vessels that are not broadcasting on AIS. So I think in that sense, the service offerings are, are similar. I think that their focus, as I understand it, is that they have a bit more fisheries expertise. So they might be able to um, help somebody understand a bit more about how this information fits into a wider MCS picture or, or how to uh, convert it into a, a useful fisheries policy. We don't really get too far afield of the, of the satellite world and the satellite derived information at the moment. Although we work with a lot of different partners to build that full picture. Um, you know, we're a small organization and we're really focused on uh, getting information off of the satellites in a useful way very quickly. Uh, I think, so I think they have a slightly different focus, but again, I don't want to speak too much about them because uh, I, just, I just don't really know. And I think they've got a little bit of an evolving business model as they separate from the catapult and, and become an independent um, nonprofit or NGO. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, a question from Pedro. Is it possible to produce daily reports on AIS uh, SAR for an entire EEZ or EEZ of a medium-sized country? And can you give a sense of what the cost for that might be, perhaps drawing on your Gabon uh, example? Um, so medium is, is not a very precise word. <laughs> um, it's hard for me to know. Um, you know, we daily of an entire EEZ is probably a, a, is probably a tall task. It depends a bit on the latitude. So if you can remember, um, or maybe I can scroll back here. Let me just see if I can get back to the slide that'll make this a little more clearer. Um, 
Right. So you can see how the, the uh, a polar orbiting satellite converges around the poles. So if you were in an area at a, at a high latitude, um, you know, uh, you're going to be able to cover much more frequently. So if you're in Europe or Northern Europe, yeah, we could probably cover the entirety of your EEZ on a daily basis by packaging different satellites together. So if any one satellite didn't do it, we could, we could build a, a combination. If you look at the picture on the right and you're trying to talk about Africa, well, you know, there might be, this satellite might not help at all on that day in, in terms of monitoring coastal Africa. And so um, some days will be better than others in terms of how the satellites combine. I would say that any given um, location, we can monitor um, at least once a day. Um, but the entirety of an EEZ is a little bit difficult to know um, in advance. So we have, uh, we would have to, I think it's, it's possible, but not necessarily um, consistently possible. In other words, on a good day, yes, um, but not necessarily every day. But, but Pedro, please follow up with me. Uh, if I had a specific a AOI or if I knew exactly what you were talking about, it's very easy for me to, um, to answer that question very precisely by creating a hypothetical acquisition plan over a range of days to show what's possible um, and to work with you on on developing a plan. That's something that's a that's a no cost consultation that I'm that we do all the time and I'm happy to help with to, to evaluate what's possible in a given location and and uh, um, How we might cover it by aggregating different satellites together. That's great. Thanks, Paul. And again, Paul's email uh, is on the final slide of the presentation. Um, uh, if anyone has questions like that for him or, or other questions. Um, a question from Corey, has this technology been used successfully to prosecute illegal fishing in MPAs in the US? Uh, if so, can you provide a case study example? No, it hasn't. So, you know, um, I don't know that this information will ever be able, particularly the SAR derived information, will never really su support prosecution because we just don't have enough certainty around who these, who, who these vessels are. So if you're using AIS, then you might, you might have a, a relatively reliable um, indication. But again, I say relatively because AIS itself is subject to, to spoofing and to um, different games that people play about where they actually are, who they actually are. I don't think any of this satellite-derived vessel detection is going to stand up in court without some sort of a, um, uh, actual maritime enforcement or a maritime boarding. So it's a, it's a tool for either building the case for active patrolling or building the case for um, activity in a remote area or for supporting active patrol. But as a standalone source, um, I don't think you're ever going to be able to use satellite information to prosecute a vessel in, in court. On, we saw a similar thing on the oil spill detection side. We were able to do um, some really fairly um, uh, persuasive uh, indications using AIS and SAR of which vessel had caused an oil spill. But the best we were able to do there was, was not exactly prosecution in court, but um, providing enough information or enough evidence for authorities to retain a vessel uh, on suspicion in court, so to investigate. And as it turns out, the amount of money these vessels were spending on being in port under investigation while they're still paying their crew, while they're paying late fees, while they're paying all sorts of other fees associated with the investigation became significant enough that it was a change in behavior and people stopped, at least in some places where, where oil spill monitoring from satellites started. Uh, the behavior of dumping waste at sea and, and changing your bilge tanks when you didn't think anybody was looking um, was able to be somewhat mitigated by the fact that if we were looking and we were able to bring a vessel in in suspicion, it was, it was expensive enough to them that even if we weren't able to use satellite information to take them to court, we could make it enough of a pain in the butt that they they that they they change some behavior. So uh, the short answer is is no. I don't think independently any of this is going to lead to something that will uh, withstand uh, scrutiny in court. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, you're you're interested in in uh, in working with MPAs as pilot projects. Uh, what are you looking for in terms of um, types of MPAs, if you have particular types in mind, large versus small, uh, offshore versus nearshore? 
Um, and what would be the, the minimum responsibilities of your MPA partners? And do they have to have some uh, technical expertise? Do they not need any in order to partner with you? Um, what, what are you looking for from potential MPA partners? So I, I don't really have a, a stock answer on, you know, um, the specifics of the MPA in terms of where it is or how big it is. Um, the really nice thing about this technology is that it's, it's, it doesn't actually require any investments. Uh, so we can monitor remotely and push information to people using basically free tools. So, you know, PDFs are, are free. You can, you can download um, Adobe Reader or Acrobat or whatever it is for free to, to read a PDF. Google Earth is free. So if we provided a KML, that's a, that's a free tool. Um, they're, they're pretty, um, I think anyways, they're pretty um, intuitive in terms of um, after, after a little bit of uh, quick education, somebody could understand what they're looking at and, and the limitations and, and appeal of what they're looking at, which is a long way of saying it's very easy for us to discreetly put together a couple of reports here and there to, to say, gosh, I have no idea if there's any vessels in this MPA at all. Let's just take a couple example images and, and leave it at that. Um, so we can do, you know, it's very scalable. We can do very small projects. We can do very large projects. I'm interested in, in people who have um, creative ideas about how this might help them achieve their objectives. And so um, open to sort of creative ideas, basically. Um, so uh, John, I don't have a very good, um, uh, I'm basically throwing this out there for people to respond to. Because I'm so new to this space, I don't, I don't really know how widespread the appeal is or if there is enough appeal. Um, I need to eventually design a commercial model around this new satellite, which needs at its foundation to have a sense of how valuable is this to practitioners in the field. And so at the moment, I'm just trying to evaluate, you know, are people enthusiastically exclamation point excited? Or do they think this might be useful, but I'm not willing to pay for it somewhere in between. Um, so I'm interested in doing pilots to sort of gauge that interest and to, to try and uncover the people who are most interested and then try and generalize from there why, under what circumstances is this information appealing or not, and, and learn from it. So I'm not even sophisticated enough, John, that I know exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking to sort of be led from this community into what is interesting to MPA practitioners. Thanks, and again, uh, you encourage people to contact you um, if they have ideas that they just wanna bounce off you. Uh, for for potential partnering or or questions about how some of the the tools that you offer could be applied to their sites that's really true I, you know I went through a lot of information really quickly I don't have a good sense of if it if it went over most people's heads or if people were sitting there nodding along please anybody out there who wants to ask a question there's no dumb questions please please follow up and engage with me directly I'm happy to talk through all this stuff I'm trying to learn as well so um, would really like to open a dialogue with anybody who, who gets excited about this. One thing that's interesting about um, the, the forthcoming micro SAR constellation that's going to come into, uh, into use next year, you said, um, being owned by the Norwegian government, uh, in light of the Norwegian government's interest in fighting IUU fishing, I wonder if uh, perhaps some Norwegian aid could be bundled with um, with application of microsar to MPA sites and to other um, you know anti IUU uh, fishing operations, uh, it would be all in one package. I don't know. You 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 may not have that may not be on anybody's radar yet, but it occurred to me that that would be pretty cool to just have one all inclusive package of the the uh, technology and um, funding. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. <laughs> no, I, I don't think you're. I don't think you're out of line in, in thinking that. I think that's that's quite true. That there are both. There is there is the Norwegian government gives a lot of um, a lot of aid money into this space. There are many other foundations, organizations, and NGOs who are looking to fund this space. A lot of this. Um, a lot of this money actually is coming from, from my perspective, a lot of this money is coming from, you know, tech entrepreneurs or people who find space sexy or people who are, you know, worried about the ocean and looking for something cool and new. And so um, finding funding for these projects is possible and there is money out there. So um, 
I think, you know, I, I think the broad answer to, to your question is, is yeah, there is, there is opportunities for finding funding. Okay. There are opportunities. That's great. Um, time for one more uh, quick question. Um, how, how would one go about getting AIS data on ship movement for research purposes? I don't need necessary real-time data uh, for North Atlantic and North Pacific gyres. Ooh, that sounds to me uh, right in Global Fishing Watch sweet spot because they are providing, as I understand it, um, time-delayed global AIS for the world. As, uh, maybe some of it you would have a hard time. I think that they are, they are specifically designed to be revealing fishing effort, so maybe it's not all AIS, um, but I think that's more or less their mandate is to provide um, free AIS information uh, in a time-delayed way globally. So if you haven't explored Global Fishing Watch, I would start there. Um, if that doesn't suit your needs, then maybe I misunderstood your question or I don't know exactly how to help you. No, I, I think that that's, that's good advice. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, with, uh, with that, we conclude this webinar. Uh, we received a number of questions. I, I think we got to everybody's. Um, on behalf of MPA News and the EBM Tools Network, I want to thank Paul Whitaker uh, for your presentation and answers. That was very interesting. I applaud KSAT's work and its outreach to the community. Again, Paul's email is on screen and he invites you to contact him with, with questions and ideas. Um, with KSAT's existing tools and with Microsar coming online next year, um, I think that there are some real opportunities for the MPA community to um, start taking advantage of, of some of these these technologies and capabilities. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'll be interested uh, via MPA News in keeping up to date on, on how these tools are being applied by MPAs. And please, anybody out there who, who does partner with KSAT or with other satellite um, companies, um, please keep MPA News in mind for getting the word out about how you're doing it. Uh, so again, thank you, Paul, and thank you to the audience for participating as well. Um, and uh, have a great day and good luck in your work. Thanks, John. Thanks, all. John, you need to end the meeting. Oh, okay. <laughs> How do I do yeah, that? Sorry. Do I have to go um, into the... Um... It's in the lower right-hand corner where it'll say end meeting. Sort of next oh, to uh, share, share screen. More. End meeting for all. Yeah.